Hello, 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 and welcome to Casual Krakoa, everybody. It's Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you are here with me live, let me know if you can see and hear appropriately here on the YouTube live stream here on the Comic Book Herald channel. Today we're going to talk about all of the X-Men comics that came out today, February 9th, 2022. We're going to talk about X-Deaths of Wolverine number two. We're going to talk about New Mutants number 24. We're going to talk about the secret X-Men. How secret are they? We're going to talk about it. And we're going to talk about a, a little bit of the return of Powers of Ten. So let me know how we're sounding, how we're looking, all of that fun stuff. I'm like, I'm like seven pounds of pasta deep tonight, okay? I had like seven pounds of pasta for dinner, and I am so carbo-loaded and so ready to go. I don't care if that's not how carbo-loading works. It is working tonight for me, and I'm ready to get into it. It's an exciting, interesting day of comic books, actually. Um, again, it's X-Deaths Week, and X-Deaths of Wolverine is the portion of the series that I am definitely most excited about. We got our 10 weekly, 10 issue weekly event, okay, from, you know, January through uh, March, basically, of interspersing X Lives of Wolverine, and then every other week it's X Deaths of Wolverine. This is an X Deaths of Wolverine week, which really means, which really means it's a Moira X week, okay, which means it's follow-up on House of X and Powers of Ten, it's follow-up on Inferno, it's follow-up on the big picture stuff, whereas Life to Wolverine, obviously, to date, has been more Logan exploring time travel shenanigans in the past. Here we have Moira in the present, but also some threats maybe from the future. Uh, I'm seeing what sauce in the comments here? Rigatoni. Uh, we had some rigatoni with vodka sauce that my wife uh, tried a new recipe today. I loved it. I ate like all of it. She was a little ho-hum on it, which honestly kind of works to my favor because then I eat like the whole pot. Um, so things are going well. Things are going well in the abusing household. Thanks for asking. If you have any other questions about pasta, about X-Men comics, about uh, the Chicago Bulls, um, about uh, Super Bowl picks, <laughs> that's this weekend. Get them in, in the live chat here uh, if you are listening live, of course. Uh, and thanks to those of you who do, the Super Chat is open. If you want to get stuff prioritized and looked at, I will try to get to as many questions as I can as I talk here today as well. But seriously, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Um, it looks like everything is working fine on the live stream. That's great. Uh, to those of you who are here, again, you can find all my stuff at comicbookherald.com. You can find me at comicbookherald pretty much anywhere on social, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Like, subscribe, share. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Hype, hype, hype. Let's do it. All right. So this week on Casual Krakoa, we're going to start here with X Deaths of Wolverine number two. Now, I do definitely have an X Deaths of Wolverine number two full on video that is very much ready to go. Okay. It is very much ready to go. Um, and it is going to be uh, going up this evening. I just haven't recorded it yet because I like to do the live stream first. You know, it's a bit of work. It's a bit of work on the pipes. Uh, sometimes I like to sing on these live streams. That taxes them even further. So you got to make sure you have the energy going into these things, right? And if there's if there's one word to describe me, um, it's two words and it's high energy. So <laughs> let's talk X Deaths of Wolverine here on the chat. This will be a spoiler filled conversation. Okay, uh, this is for the assumption is that you have read this week's comics. If you have not, and you're worried about that, uh, definitely come back later after you have. Uh, if you're not worried about spoilers, great. We're just going to talk about these in some amount of detail. I am seeing here in the chat that it is question marks birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, I hope you are having a great one, uh, as enigmatic as you may be. Maybe you are related to Enigma with that handle of the question mark. Uh, big month. Big month for Nygma fans as we head into the Batman with the Riddler. Um, I'm excited for it. I'm excited for that one. I, I hope that it's good. I, I suspect that it might be. Theory, Batman might be good. All right, next, <laughs> that's Wolverine. Um, this one's good. It's not as good as uh, X that's Wolverine number one. I will say, uh, but X Death Wolverine number one was all about setting the stage, right? It was all about, oh, okay, this is the Moira book. Didn't see that coming. Didn't know that's what this was going to be. Cool, exciting. What are we doing here? Um, X Death number X Death number two. It just picks up, you know, more or less where we left off, right? In in X Death number one, right? This is full speed ahead. Moira's on the lam. Um, she is on the run. She's got her her Moira shit wig. Uh, if you've seen Shit's Creek, I'm not just cursing to curse. <laughs> oh, she's got the blondes going, and uh, and she's on the run. But like it's the least effective on the run ever because one, she's just walking around convenience stores with her phalanx arm out, like <laughs> super obviously. And two, apparently everyone and, and their mothers and their wives and their sisters and their girlfriends and everyone can track 
a techno-organic phalanx arm, okay? Uh, apparently that is just very easily done, and she is easily found here by Mystique. Um, nonetheless, it's a very effective issue, and there's some stealthily big stuff here. There's some stealthily big stuff, okay? Um, so let's talk about it. So again, it's a pretty straightforward follow-up to the exciting first issue. Uh, the things that I liked the most about x Death number two is we get more information here about the Fey Logan, okay? The Phalanx Logan that popped up in x Death number one. Now, if you remember from that past issue, uh, in the middle of x Death number one, there's like a, a thing comes up out of the middle of Krakoa, out of the earth of the mutant nation, and a wolverine pops out of it. Now, we know from X Lives that the wolverine, as we understand it, our wolverine from this present timeline, is sitting on a slab with Professor X and Jean doing their psychic thing, sending his consciousness back in time in various escapades, protecting young Professor X or various members of the Xavier line, okay, to ensure that Professor X lives to build Krakoa. So this other Wolverine is something new. It is someone new. And what we learn here, okay, is that, like, this Wolverine is from the Phalanx, okay? This is a Phalanx Wolverine. How do we learn that? Well, we learn it in a data page, okay? We see one of Sage's x 4 c data pages, and, um, and, you know, she's analyzing, translating the noises, the sounds that this Wolverine makes, even though we read the text, which was just like, I'm no one, I'm not here, apparently when translated into whatever cipher is used here, it's just a repetition of, we are phalanx, we are phalanx, we are phalanx, okay, uh, over and over and over again. So this is not a surprise, right? Like, this is not a surprise. Like, I've been calling him Fay Logan for a long time, okay, which is a combination of phalanx and Logan, for those of you playing along at home, and like like the covers show him with the techno organic -y phalanx stuff. Um, this is not a surprise, but it is confirmed, and that's cool, right? We know, okay, this is a Wolverine who is inhabited, is part of a phalanx hive mind. I mean, I think one of the bigger pieces of the puzzle that's important with this detail is not that this Wolverine is incorporating, you know, phalanx armor, essentially, right? And Moira's doing that right now with her warlock arm, right? Or for half this issue, she is. Um, obviously, we see Doug doing that all the time, Doug, Doug Ramsey with Warlock. Um, what this, the text indicates to me, all this we are phalanx stuff, is that this Wolverine is, like, gone. Like, this Wolverine does not necessarily have any Logan left, Okay, this is a Wolverine shell that is now part of a phalanx hive mind. That is the implication I'm getting here, okay? That this is full-on true phalanx enemy, probably, kind of just a Wolverine shell, if you will, a Wolverine husk, which seemingly has all the same sort of capabilities, right, in terms of healing factor, in terms of claws, in terms of murderous appetite, okay? But that actually is somewhat meaningful, and the other piece of this that is more meaningful is in this issue, Forge does, is doing analysis on the pod, on the, the floral whatever that Wolverine, Omega Wolverine, as they're calling him, I call him Faye Logan, comes up out of, and he finds here some surprising details that this thing is a thousand years older than Krakoa itself, that it is Krakoan in nature, but it is a thousand years older than they know Krakoa to be, okay? Again, given the nature of X lives and X deaths, time travel should not be a shock, but this is confirmation that time travel, that this pod coming from the future, is my understanding of this, is basically a lock now. Now, this opens up two major possibilities. Um, one is what I predicted when X Lives came out, or when X Death Number 1 came out. My prevailing theory at the time was that this Wolverine is likely from the Omega Sentinel timeline, which was revealed in Inferno number three, okay, in the Jonathan Hickman written issue, when it's revealed that Omega Sentinel is actually the key player behind Orcus, is pulling all of the strings basically in the mutant, or in the machine uprising, and that that Omega Sentinel is from a future where mutants always win, okay? So the understanding throughout this era of X-Men has been mutants always lose, Omega Sentinel's future was actually mutants always win, and then that machine goes back in time, so Omega Sentinel is here to found Orcus to prevent that future from coming to pass. My theory is this Wolverine, Phalanx Wolverine, is very likely from that future, okay? That's my number one prevailing theory. It still stands. Now, the number two theory that most people like to talk about and that I am increasingly inclined to consider here and am excited about is 
because this is from the future, well, what future have we seen with the phalanx presence, right? Well, yes, uh, Omega Sentinels most recently, but run it back two and a half years ago, two and a half years, to Powers of Ten, and in Powers of Ten, of course, Moira's sixth life, as we learn in Powers of, of Ten number six, is a phalanx timeline, right? It is where Moira and Wolverine are kept prisoners. They are kept like um, like Billy Pilgrim in Slaughterhouse-Five by the, what are they, the, the Trophlegarians, something like that. And, um, and, and they're kept in a cage, basically, by Homo Novissima, who wants to ascend to a phalanx-looking hive mind, whether it's a Dominion or whatever galactic intelligence they officially are, right? That is, that's where we see that, is from Powers of Ten. So there's a possibility that we're looking at lifetime travel, that we're not just looking at time travel, that we're looking at a Wolverine from Moira's sixth life, sent back, infested by the phalanx, now out to kill her and prevent things from happening, or whatever this Wolverine's official plan is, although, I mean, every every action and every lack of any personality or any Logan attached to this character indicates, like, yeah, the, this, this machine is here to kill. Um, so, that seems a little less likely to me, albeit actually more exciting. Like, I think it's actually more exciting <laughs> if the Moira's Six life, which was a thousand years in the future, has found a way to traverse lifelines because we almost take it for granted, or I almost take it for granted that like, well, Moira's lifelines surely must come into play, right? We've got the Rasputin and Zorn thing, like they're out there traveling through black holes. Who knows what they're doing? Will we find out one day? Maybe, but it's been two and a half years, right? If a lifeline actually crosses over and we actually get one, of, and again, for those of you who may have forgotten or just you, it's been a minute or whatever, Moira's mutant ability is to, when she dies, she resurrects with the knowledge of her previous lifeline. Okay, that is her mutant ability. And um, in life six, that lifeline ends, but if someone or something from that lifeline was able to transport to the present lifeline, that is totally new. That is uncharted territory, okay? That is something we have not seen before and something that is incredibly exciting because it opens up so much potential story that has not been done. So if that's what's happening here, that's the most exciting possibility. That's the most exciting possibility because that locks in we're seeing Rasputin and Zorn. <laughs> like that locks in that characters from Moira's Ninth Life, from other lifelines, are in play. Again, I think the most likely thing that is happening here is that it's the time travel and that it's from the Omega Sentinel future. Again, the fact that this Wolverine is referred to as Omega Wolverine, the fact that that was a development that was just revealed in Inferno, which ended in January, um, and just the fact that that's easier, <laughs> I suppose, in some ways. Uh, I think kind of adds up for me. Uh, but it's an exciting development. It's cool. Like, I, I definitely like what is happening in X Deaths. I mean, all the all the stuff that is happening here, again, this issue plays fairly straightforwardly, but this is big stuff that is happening that is going to shake up Krakoa, that is going to have an impact, um, whether it's time travel or lifeline travel. Like, that's going to have an impact on the state of Krakoa and clearly, clearly on the state of what's going on with Moira. Uh, what is going to happen with Moira? Does she make it out of this alive? Again, like, it seems, or it certainly seemed until, you know, almost just a month ago, unfathomable that Moira could be taken off the board. Like, that sounded, like, like a month ago, before Inferno number four, that sounded like one of the worst ideas I could have heard, and also one of the least likely. <laughs> and now, it actually seems somewhat plausible that you could actually have this end with Moira just everything just, I mean, because right now, like, Mystique wants to kill her, okay? Moira avoids that in this issue by cutting off her own phalanx arm and uh, and tricking Mystique with a bomb in a motel room, right? She avoids that one. Um, who knows who else on Krakoa might have it out for Moira at this point in time, right? We don't even know, really, what the rest of the Quiet Council or anyone else is thinking. We know, like, the CIA is out to get her with the X-Desk and all that stuff. We know she has stage 4 cancer, uh, which is revealed here, to be a part of, or to have have manifested through all the time she spent in Krakoa's no place biome, which was something I theorized, you know, because those are referred to as like tumors essentially that Krakoa doesn't even know about. Um, Moira's reaction to sort of the understanding that her cancer is no place based is a little surprise and anger, and she says they did this to me. I, I'm interested there who the they is intending to reference, right? Because one, 
it, it seemed like Moira was on board with hiding in the no places. This seems to indicate otherwise, right? Like, so I'm, there's a lot of questions I have around like, okay, when Moira, Magneto, and Professor X are setting up Krakoa, what are the conversations around what her role is going to be? and um, where she's going to live and what she's going to be doing. Like, all of that is still very nebulous and up in the air, okay? But that aside, if, it's, if, it's, if we accept that, like, oh, Professor X and Magneto thought to put her in a no place in order to, if she ever left, give her cancer, requires an understanding of Krakoa and what's happening that I don't know how they would have. I don't know how they would have that knowledge. Um, same for Mystique, same for Destiny, right, who obviously had no role in putting her in that no place. The only answer I could see that would make some sense would be Doug and um, and Warlock and Krakoa themselves, obviously, because Krakoa, as, as a sentient island, would actually seemingly have the capacity to do something like this. Um, but again, that raises the question of like, well, Doug, Doug stepped in in Inferno number four to save Moira from Mystique and Destiny killing her, okay? He gave her a chance. Did he exclusively do that? so that Mystique would not break the kill no man law right in his face? Like, is that it? Was it just like, well, we got to have laws? Um, or did he actually want Murder to survive for some period of time? Because if that's the case, and he gave her, you know, like, like terminal cancer, like, what is the rationale there? I mean, the, the, I feel like there's more to this story, just like I feel like there's more to Doug giving Moira the arm. You know, they, the, in Inferno number four, the Hickman written issue, Doug, Warlock, Krakoa, they combined to get, fix Myra's arm, which D Mystique and Destiny had just cut off. Myra's getting this arm cut off a lot, more than most. I would say she's had her arm cut off more than most people have our arms cut off at this point in time. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. And they give her this phalanx arm. And there's kind of the implication there that, like, well, we're giving you, you know, your, your cool Luke Skywalker hand, but also, um, you know, we can track you now, right? We, we've got the Warlock stuff on you, which, fair enough. Okay, that made sense at the time. Uh, but now she cuts it off immediately. <laughs> immediately, like two issues in, which is like, is this just like a, a simply creative differences where Heckman's like, here's this thing, do what you want with it. And Percy's like, I don't want to do anything with it. Cut it off. Um, or possibly, is there way more to what Doug's doing? Is there way more to what Doug, Warlock, and Krakoa are scheming? Because some of the Ed's actions, I, I don't know, it feels fast. It feels strange that they gave her this arm and she's done with it immediately. Like, why do that? You know? Um, I'm also somewhat uh, perplexed why Mystique uh, can track a phalanx arm so easily or a techno-organic arm so easily. Um, it, it, that's an easy enough thing to get work around, I suppose, you know? Okay, Forge built her some tech. Okay, boom, done. Um, but uh, it didn't seem clear to me. That didn't seem clear to me. So, yeah, there's there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I mean, I'm seeing in the comments here, I'm seeing a handful of people saying, um, this is literally Terminator 2. <laughs> Which, yeah, like that is the one Terminator I've seen. I know, shame on me. Um, and, and yes, <laughs> like it is, uh, I don't think there's any mistaking that, uh, I'm hopeful that there will be some twists and turns, you know, and this is where, this is probably where, you know, it kind of ties back to being the most hopeful that this is a Wolverine from the sixth lifeline, as opposed to the time traveling Wolverine, because that's going to require some science fiction and explanation that is outside of the common, a little more cliched, a little more understood, a little more explored territory of, you know, I, I've been sent from the future to destroy you, right? Um, so that one, that's why I'm somewhat hopeful for that, but also just it'd be cool as heck and would open up a lot of a lot of territory. But yeah, I mean, I think if, if you're reading this thinking like, okay, it's Terminator 2 with, with Wolverine and Moira, um, yeah, uh, I think it's going to be need to be a little bit more than that. I think it's going to need to do some surprising things um, to, to, you know, to really... To really excel. I mean, because right now I would say we're 40% through X lives and X deaths, okay? Um, we're 40% of the way through this thing. And X deaths number two, or number one, obviously saved it for me quickly, right? It, it became like, okay, I'm, I'm excited about this. Yeah, this is cool. X deaths is going to be awesome. Um, and X lives, like I'm more invested in just because that stuff's good. That said, it's not a mash piece, right? Like this, this isn't going on any best of the year lifts unless the last several issues like are bomb after bomb after bomb, right? Like they're going to have to come hot and heavy and, and really hit it. Um, I don't expect that. That said, I do think it's exceeding expectations. Again, my expectations were, I was very trepidatious going into this. I did not anticipate um, 
it would be outstanding, and it's been pretty good. It's been better than I hoped. It's doing stuff I didn't anticipate it would do, um, that I hoped it might do, but didn't think that it would, would, right? So I think on that level, X Lives and X Deaths is exceeding expectations, I would say, in the right ways. Um, but it's not, it's not like a knockout, you know? Um, it's not, it's not, it hasn't done anything too tremendous, right? It's just playing with the potential to do so, which is great, you know? That, that I, I hope that that, you know, continues to come to fruition, throughout the remaining 60% of the issue, and I'm definitely here to see what happens. The Krakoan for the next issue reads Blood in the Water. Uh, it's going to be X Lives of Wolverine number three. I mistranslated this initially as Brood in the Water and was real excited. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, what past timeline did Wolverine interact with the Brood? Does this mean we're going to X-Men days, you know, circa uh, Uncanny 170 through 175 or whatever it is, 160 through 165 maybe? Um, but uh, but no, it's, I'm pretty sure it's Blood in the Water. <laughs> so uh, a little a little more nebulous. Um, I'm seeing here, see the first Terminator? Uh, make me. <laughs> That's what I'll say to that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm vaguely interested. I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's not number one on my... I gotta go back and watch something list. That's all I'll say. It's not number one on the uh, on the movie list. But if, if I see enough pressure here, I'm easily peer pressured, and I could be swayed to watch the first Terminator. Uh, that could be done. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, get your questions in. Get your thoughts in here on X Deaths of Wolverine. Um, I'm seeing here in the comments as well. Matt Draper just did a video essay on the first Terminator. Matt Draper, friend of Comic Book Herald, publishes essays a bunch uh, and uh, and does obviously awesome work here on YouTube. Everybody should go check that out. Maybe I'll watch that and Matt can explain to me Terminator instead of watching the movie. That's my favorite thing. That's my favorite, favorite thing is uh, instead of reading a story, I'll just have someone tell me a story. <laughs> Experience art. That's all I'm saying. Uh, all right, so... What else do we got today? Uh, if, if we have some questions coming in on X deaths, uh, I definitely want to touch on those. Otherwise, I'm going to move forward and talk about um, some of the other comics that came out today. I think I talked about the biggest stuff with X deaths. X deaths. Say that 20 times fast. Uh, we did have a question before I started here. Uh, somebody asked, Yo, Dave, can we touch on the second X-Men vote? I hope it's an annual thing. The new secret X-Men team proves we need more lesser-known mutants on these teams. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we don't have the winner yet, right, uh, for the X-Men vote. We'll know when um, when the Hellfire Gala happens again this year, right, and, and the new individual added to the X-Men team. Uh, I mean, I think all, all expectations are it's going to be Firestar. The only seemingly possible upset would have been Monet, who was my, initially was my pick for, like, oh, yeah, Monet's obviously going to be the pick. She's the biggest... X character by far in the comic scene, that of course overlooked the fact that when this vote is put to the masses, uh, Firestar was in a cartoon <laughs> as Spider-Man and his amazing friends, and that like trumps everything by by far. So, probably gonna be Firestar, um, but yeah, don't have a ton of thoughts on that. I mean, in terms of it being an annual thing, yeah, like that's everything that the X office has said was, uh, was that that's what it's gonna be, that every year, they're going to do a new X-Men vote. They're going to announce the winners at the Hellfire Gala. Um, that's a cool annual practice. I like it. I like the idea. I think it's a, a fun, especially just doing these elections, is obviously a fun way to get the fan base involved and activated and all fun stuff. Um, and then you get to do like a secret X-Men thing like this, which, you know, we can talk about the comic in detail. Uh, my question for the issue going into this is basically, why is secret X-Men? <laughs> Full stop. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a cool idea. It's a cool idea. Um, okay, we got a, a question here in the Super Chat. I'm going to pull that. Super Chat is available if you want to make sure your question gets prioritized. Again, otherwise I will just hop in and out as I'm talking here. Um, the question is from Brandon. Brandon asks, do you think Valkyrie, knowing that mutants are hunting Moira, may play a part in the Judgment Day comic with her joining the Avengers? I, I hope the Valkyrie involvement is something that can be sustained and, and built upon. Um, Moira's doctor friend being Jane Foster was a great call. <laughs> like, like one of the stealth best calls of the entire Benjamin Percy era of X-Force Wolverine and now X-Lives and X-Deaths. Like, I love that detail. It's awesome. That's a great connection. Jane Foster, for those of you who don't know, longtime romantic interest of Thor, then became Thor in the excellent Jane Foster, Russell Donnerman, Matthew Wilson run, and now is the current present-day uh, Marvel Valkyrie. Um, 
do, do I think that means she's going to be involved with the Avengers in Judgment Day? Uh, no, not necessarily. But that said, that would make sense. Um, that's, a, that's a practical theory that uh, Valkyrie should and could be involved. I mean, I think the reason I don't think it's super likely and, and maybe is not going to happen is I don't expect Moira is going to have a big role in Judgment Day at all. Um, but as with all things Moira X, I hope to be proven wrong because I love this character. This character's great after House of X number two, and the more involved she can be, the better, right? So it, it'll be cool to see. But good, uh, good question because I do think that that would be. It. I mean, I guess the big question is if Moira survives this, okay, and she finds a way out, she finds a role, um, whatever. Like, because we don't know. Like, she's just pure on the run, spy shenanigan stuff. We have no concept of what her. What would she do if she had twenty four hours to collect herself? What would she be trying to do? Right? Okay, her big picture plan was to cure mutant kind in this lifeline. Maybe. Right? If Krakoa failed. Maybe. Like, we don't know the timing of that even. Um, what would she do? Would she go back to her lab? Would she finish researching? Would she join up with Orcus and do her work there? Would she try to team up with Abigail Brand in some capacity? Um, would she go to the Avengers? Right? What would Moira X do is actually a really interesting and fun question to see explored. The challenge is, I don't know what book that would be explored in. Right? We get out of X lives and we get out of X deaths. If she survives, where does that get explored? Immortal X Men, written by Karen Gillan, um, is a possibility. That would be the that would be like maybe the best place for it. But again, like if she's working with Abigail Brand, maybe it goes to Al Ewing in um, X Men Red, right? So you got possibilities. Um, but but that I think is a big question. And also like the reason why I don't think that Moira has to make it out of this alive, which again I, I started to say would have seemed unfathomable just a month ago, is she can always be resurrected as a mutant. Probably, right? Like, we, we got a lot of outs if she dies to bring her back when mutant kind might need her. And I could see the story going to that point. I could see the story going to that place, which I think would be disappointing. Um, again, for all the reasons I was sort of just elucidating, like, like I want to know what Moira's doing. Like, one thing we, that we're reminded of so heavily here is she's one bad mother. <laughs> like, like, she's literally a bad mother, right? Like, Talk to Proteus. But, like, she has one bad mother, okay? Like, she has, like, CIA training, Black Ops training. She's an assassin, right? Like, Moira X is a cool, cool character. I want to see more of what she's doing, what she's planning, um, even as it works against mutant kind, right? Moira X as an antagonist is probably even more interesting. I was well, definitely more interested than Moira sitting in a note place doing nothing and never seeing her. What about Moira X, the antagonist? So that's why I want to see the character stick around. That said, I could see the story going to a place where, like, actually, we are going to kill her. Um, big shock. Uh, but then, of course, you know, we're leaving the door open to, well, she was a mutant. Maybe she could be resurrected later. Um, that that feels like a, a possibility, I would say. Get in those questions. Let's talk. <laughs> Moira will become a Valkyrie. Uh, I <laughs> I doubt it, but there's there's precedent here, right? Danny Moonstar is is connected to the Valkyries um, on with the New Mutants. Uh, that would be a wild twist <laughs> that I would definitely not see coming. That'd be kind of fun. I'm into it. I'm into it. Seeing a, a statement here from William. Since Hickman left, I feel the X Men are in a sharp decline. Well, it's only been a month. <laughs> it's only been a month, and not that much has changed. Honestly, not that much has changed. I, too soon to call. I mean, listen. Big fan. I've talked about it a lot, obviously. I like the writing, and I like the, the Marvel comics of Jonathan Hickman. Um, I'm doing a series called Hickmania, where we go through the creator own works of Jonathan Hickman. It's it's on my podcast on Comic Book Herald. It's on the YouTube channel here. Uh, the, the first one on Nightly News is already up. Uh, Pax Romana's going up in, like, six days. Like, subscribe to the channel. You get Pax Romana conversation. It's a good one. It's a really good one. Um, I, I don't think we can say the X-Men are in a sharp decline yet. Uh, related specifically to the one month period since Hickman left on Inferno number four. Now, if you want to run it back earlier than that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but the actual comics as they stand have basically been the same quality that they've been primarily throughout the reign of X um, with some stuff that's been even cooler, right? Uh, you know, X deaths has been pretty good. Uh, New Mutants, I love. That came out today. And then we have the Secret X-Men. Okay, let's talk about the Secret X-Men. Um, this comic is written by Tini Howard, artist Francesco Mobili, colors by Jesus Abertov, letters by Clayton uh, Coles. This is the post-Hellfire Gala. So we're talking about the vote, right? In Hellfire Gala, there's 
a bunch of X-Men who are nominated, or a bunch of mutants who are nominated to officially be on the superhero X-Men team roster. That is the roster that is utilized in the Jerry Duggan written, Pepe Le Ra's drawn frequently um, X-Men series going on right now, which has been growing on me. Um, and th there's only one winner, right? Polaris wins. She makes it onto the team, but then you got all these cast-offs. You got Strong Guy, Tempo, Forge, Banshee, Armor, Boom Boom, uh, Sunspot, Cannonball, and Meryl. Okay? They all didn't win. And what the Secret X-Men is, is basically um, them kind of talking about their frustrations with not winning at the Hellfire Gala. Uh, Bobby, DaCosta, Sunspot getting the idea to like, hey, we should totally be an X-Men team sometime. And then there's actually occasion to do that up in Shi'ar space where, where Sunspot and Cannonball reside. Um, and that's where we pick up with, with Sunspot and Deathbird's uh, romance is too strong, <laughs> flirtation, um, and there's another attempt, yet another attempt, on Empress Zandra's life, okay, Empress of the Shi'ar, also the daughter of Professor Charles Xavier. Um, so that is the premise for the Secret X-Men. It's a totally weird hodgepodge of characters, definitely. I mean, I think if you love just seeing a bunch of mutants that you don't normally get to see uh, hanging out and interacting together, this is probably a good comic for you. Um, it is. It does not want to be anything more than just lots of mutants hanging out and having a good time. It is mostly a Sunspot and Cannonball comic, um, very much in the spirit of, of Hickman's clear fascination with that friendship and bromance between those characters. Okay. Um, it is not especially meaningful or connected to much. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't love it. I didn't think it was great. Um, I, I I was pretty bored by it. I think it's fine. It's competent. Um, but I think I thought it was very average, you know, for this big one shot kind of thing. Um, the thing I like the most about the Secret X Men, I will say, is there's a data page uh, that is a word jumble, and you have to solve it to reveal the secret password so that the team can in story get through a gate. That was cool. <laughs> I love that. Do more word puzzles as data pages, and I am here for it, right? Just straight up put the day's wordle into the comics, and I will thumbs up, <laughs> right? I'm into it. Uh, that was super fun. That was my favorite thing about the Secret X-Men. But again, if you're like a big uh, Sunspot and Cannonball fan, you probably want to check this one out. Um, if you're a huge uh, tempo actually being in a comic and getting dialogue fan, uh, check out Marauders. <laughs> I guess, uh, that then you have, you do have other options. Um, is Secret X-Men an ongoing? I don't think so. I think it was just one shot. Uh, I could be mistaken there. Um, if it wasn't, I'd be a little more critical <laughs> if this was still going to be going. I don't think it is though. I think it's one shot. Um, okay. So that was the Secret X-Men. Um, you definitely, definitely can pass. Okay, unless you're a big fan of those characters, it is passable. Uh, you know, and it actually, so it made me think, I was thinking about this, in comparison to the other comic that came out today that is isn't X-Deaths, which is New Mutants number 24, um, they're very comparable, I think, in a lot of ways, because New Mutants, and a big thing that VDIL has been doing in that series, is really big character moments, and really leaning into conversations between these characters, how they interact, and the feelings that they have about each other. It, that book is big on feelings, okay? Um, but in New Mutants, it's frequently, like, each issue is miraculously thematically connected. Um, the, the work that goes into, the thinking around structuring, okay, we're going to have, like, five different characters um, dealing with some problems in this issue, and they're all going to kind of relate. They're all going to be going through recovery from a certain kind of trauma um, or, or you know, relationship difficulties, right? They're all having somewhat similar challenges, and that's going to thematically connect and build to an overarching story. That is amazing what's happening in that book. Um, it's something where, to the point where, I, when I started reading New Miss 24, I was like, okay, we don't have Rod Race on art, so I'm, I'm already a little, you know, I'm a little weary. Um, and then it's like, okay, it's a lot of people getting in their feelings, and I and I just, I don't have relationships with these characters where they're like, um, I, I have strong emotional connections to them on a, you know, almost familial basis, which I think probably puts me in a minority of fandom, frankly. It seems like a lot, or at least X-Men fandom, right? A ton of X-Men fandom is very connected emotionally to what these characters are going through. 
Um, I rarely experience that. <laughs> I will just say, um, that's just me on a personal level. Uh, I'm definitely here more often than not for big picture stuff, for, for plot, um, for big ideas. Okay. Uh, that said, I know this is what New Mutants likes to do. Um, but reading this issue at the start of it, I'm kind of you know, like, I'm kind of like, okay, like this is, it's going to be one of these issues. We're having lots of different conversations. Ileana's talking about to Richter about, you know, what should we be doing for mutant kind? What does it mean to be a mutant? Um, and, and, and on and on and on, okay? But then as the comic goes, and we have like four or five of those situations um, with, you know, all these different characters. We have Cosmar and, and Danny Moonstar having a connection and being like, I'm sorry I rejected you in the Crucible. Um, we have um, Farouk, Amal Farouk, now coming out of a post, hopefully permanent <laughs> Shadow King out of your system thing and talking about, well, what kind of forgiveness can be extended? to someone like that, um, if any, at all. And what's their role going to be? It seems like it's going to be rehabilitation and then working with Legion on Mars, which is interesting. Um, and, and it's just all these different conversations. And as it builds and as it does more and more, by the end of the issue, I have the experience I keep having with New Mutants, which is like, I don't know how it did. I don't know how it fit that much into a single issue. It's crazy. I don't know how it fit that many moments and that many pieces and that many characters into a single issue and made it work and all built to something that actually makes sense. It's incredibly impressive. And I it, it got me to the point where I'm, and this is the thing that I tweeted, which is the X-Men writer who has most effectively fulfilled the promise of the Krakoa era is Vita Ayala. Like no one has captured that, captured that more successfully than Ayala and primarily races New Mutants. Um, like no one, not Hickman, not anyone. Like this New Mutants book is about what it's like to be a mutant on Krakoa in a way that no other book has succeeded at as much. It's a great run. Like, it's really, really impressive stuff. Even when it's not, it doesn't have the hook or it doesn't have the plot or the ideas necessarily as, like, a Deaths of Wolverine that I can sink into and look back to the powers and ten of it all. Like, it, maybe it doesn't have that, and it actually does have a few moments like that we'll talk about. Um, but it does that better than anyone. It's really, really impressive. And again, like, I wasn't as into the art this issue, okay? Like, I definitely, I'm, I'm a big Rod Rice fan, um, you know, friend of, friend of the comic book Um, So, like, I definitely like stuff. Denilo, uh, Bayruth here. We got Dan Brown on colors, letters by Travis Lanham. Um, I love this Martin Simmons cover. This Martin Simmons cover is fantastic. Uh, really, really good stuff. Um, but just like, you know, we get James welcoming back John Proudstar back to life after Trial of Magneto number five. Um, we have Maddie Pryor just hanging out <laughs> at the bar with no name. What's going on there? There's just all these thematically connective issues, um, and it just fully reflects what the Krakoa era can and should be. You know, it is trying to define mutant kind and mutant culture in a way um, that is that is personal, that is interrelated connectivity between characters um, in a way that I just don't think anything else has done. I, I've been blown away. I've been blown away by this. Uh, and, and, you know, I continue to be. So again, like New Mutants number 24, I expect I like New Mutants number 25 more, um, because it's, it's going to get into the labor of magic and that's the Krakoan for the next issue. And it's going to do more of the action type stuff. Um, but this issue to me just sells so much like why I fell in love for this issue in the first place, because it's like the degree of difficulty in this thing is, and making it work is, is wild. Like it, it just doesn't have to. And that's when I, you know, the comparison then is with the secret X-Men is, okay, like, we don't have, like, it's a one-shot, so, like, we don't have a build-up to all these character moments. Um, it's just people hanging out in a room, and that's a hard thing to do in a single issue, period. Um, but it's just, like, it's just goofball hanging out, and there's nothing to it. There's no idea. It's just characters interacting. Um, and that can be fun, I guess, if they're characters you love. And I don't know. There are probably examples that I, even I'm into, and maybe I'm being hypocritical, uh, but this one definitely didn't do it for me. All right, uh, the other really cool piece of um, New Mutants number 24 is there's a moment here where uh, Martha Johansson, a.k.a. No Girl, requests a body, okay, um, and a new name, and is reborn as Cerebella, okay? Um, this is cool on just a, a character level because No Girl has, has been like a brain in a jar since I think it was a Grand Morrison creation in New X-Men, um, since they were introduced there and hasn't ever had a body. And people have asked, like, why? <laughs> like, it's, that's weird in the Krakow era when you can be resurrected and and come back and, you know, walk around on two legs, right? Um, and that happens here. 
they realize, like people realize like, oh, we just, we never asked, we never thought to. Um, big miss, right? But it, but is reborn as Cerebella. And what's so cool about this moment, as we talk about Powers of Ten Connections and X Deaths of Wolverine, is uh, um, Cerebella, this design with the little glass jar on the brain, but a full human body, looks exactly <laughs> like Silabel, the black brain telepath from Powers of Ten. That's an exciting touch, okay? That's a cool, cool connection, where now it's like, oh, okay, we're building two things that were seated in Powers of Ten. Again, it's been two and a half years, so like one of the things that I think X-Men fans and, and myself, you know, maybe forget is the best mysteries, all the most interesting stuff that hasn't been done is in Powers of Ten, okay? And now we're seeing all these little seeds a Phalanx Wolverine, Silabel looking design. We're seeing these things pop into comics, and that is very, very exciting. Um, does it mean anything at this juncture? Not necessarily, right? Like Silabel is one of the sinister clone type designs anyway, but now you start to see like, okay, maybe maybe this is building block A to get us to the powers of 10 future, you know, X, Y, Z, you know? And that that's good. I want to see a lot more of that because that actually connects dots in a way that we really haven't seen done super thoroughly. Um, because it's been a, a very slow build, you know, to, to get to this point. So yeah, I'm, I'm all in on the mutants. I love this run. Um, I'm definitely really, really excited to see where it goes from here. I saw a question here about, um, and also like magic teaming with Maddie Pryor to deal with, um, limbo stuff. Come on. That's perfect. That's perfect. I'm so excited for that. Uh, you know, based on their, their histories with Blasco and Inferno and all that stuff. So yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Okay, there was a question here uh, of, did anyone enjoy Sabretooth? Or, like, did anyone care about Sabretooth? Um, yeah, <laughs> Sabretooth's really good. Uh, I talked about it in uh, last week's Casual Krakoa, um, but but Saber like, that would have been a question I would have been asking, devoid of context or devoid of any familiarity with Victor Laval. I would have been like, who cares about a Sabretooth book? Um, because I trust Laval's track record as an author, uh, a lot, <laughs> and, uh, and, and read the first issue, I can tell you it's very, very good. It is so much better than a Sabretooth mini has any right to be, than that character deserves, frankly. Like, again, Sabretooth's a monster. Sabretooth sucks. Um, we have a piece up right now on comicbookherald.com. It's, uh, David Bowen. He's a really, really amazing writer. Check out all his stuff on Comic Herald if you're interested in, like, X-Men explorations and explanations of stuff. Like, if you think I do an okay job explaining X-Men stuff, you're going to love his writing on CBH. Like, he does it so much more thoroughly and so much better than I even could, truly. Um, so he has a piece up, actually, on Sabretooth. He has two pieces up right now. He's reflecting on the Duggan and the Roz run that came out today, and then um, a piece on Sabretooth on the start, which is going to be like a three-part piece because he has so much to say about it. Um, but one thing he really highlights is Sabretooth sucks. <laughs> like, canonically, historically, Sabretooth is worse than you even think. I, I'm going to guess, okay? And... That's a hard character to write. Laval, Leonard Kirk, the creative team, they found an in. They found an in. They found a way to make it successful and to explore what's up with the Krakoan pit and to make that an allegory for the, you know, carceral state in prisons uh, across the world. It is very, it is a very, very good kickoff issue. I have extremely high hopes and high confidence for the five-issue mini. Um, I think it's going to be one of the best comics of the year. Uh, truly. Like, that is, that's what I expect from Sabretooth. And I've never expected anything like that from Sabretooth before <laughs> in any capacity, okay? Um, but yes, so does anyone care about it? Yeah, like, I think everybody who, not everybody who read it, but definitely, like, the critical consensus that I saw was this is great, um, and that that is certainly how I feel, okay? So if you're on the fence about it because it's a character that you never would have thought you'd want to spend time with, um, this won't change your mind in terms of wanting to spend time with them, but it's a really good book. It's a really good comic, and it's got something to say. And that's, that's always valuable. So, all right, get in any questions if you got them, and I will address. Otherwise, I will tackle the last few questions, and then I can uh, then I can go back to, you know, see if I can do another pound of pasta. We'll see what happens tonight. All right, thanks everybody for joining live. I do really appreciate it. Again, you can find all my stuff at Comic Book Herald on Twitter, at Comic Book Herald on Instagram. Uh, the YouTube channel, of course, is Comic Book Herald. Like, subscribe, share, comment, all that fun stuff. That helps me out a bunch. I'm going to do a full X-Deaths of Wolverine number two, Crack and Krakoa. 
Um, so that'll be a little more concise. I'll go into a lot of the stuff I talked about here, um, but you know, a little more concise, a little more detail here and there. And of course, you can find that on the channel. Uh, again, comicbookherald.com. We got lots of really, really great stuff stuff going up. Like I mentioned with David Bowen's articles here explaining X Men, um, and of course, we got all sorts of other uh, explorations. You know, I got the if you're if you want to know if you're a little behind on X Men, you want to know the order to read these comics. I do have um, you know every issue of this entire Krakoa era is ordered chronologically, or at least according to what I think makes sense in terms of reading order. Uh, it's in three parts right now. Part one is like House of X through the Dawn of X. Then we got Reign of X. Then you got um, the Destiny of X, which I'm just kicking off now and updating. Again, you can find all those links. Some of them are in the show notes, um, but all of it's on comicbookherald.com. And uh, what else? I'm updating the Devil's Reign reading order, reading that event. Um, Devil's Reign has been like solid. I think like if you're invested in the Chip Zdarsky, Marco Cicchetto, um Daredevil run to this point, which I have been because it's been one of the best Marvel books for a few years, uh, Devil's Reign's a good continuation of that. I mean, it, it's the it's the thing where like, okay, is this capital E event material? Like, it, it's so hard to write a good capital E event, okay, in superhero comics. Let's just be clear. Like, those are, the ones that hit, hit hard, um, but like, it's so hard to do, okay? And I think right now, Devil's Reign's four issues in, it's going to be six. Um, I think it is, it is telling the story it wants to tell, and it is telling it confidently, and it looks great. Um, I don't think it's like crazy special, or anything like that. I mean, I realistically, realistically too, like it's a, it's in a lot of ways, it's, it's the next arc of Daredevil, right? But it's just big enough that you can loop in tie-ins that it can, you can have a Devil's Reign X-Men, right? And the X-Men get involved because, you know, so the premise here is, is Mayor Fisk, Kingpin, Wilson Fisk is mayor. Um, he, he declares, you know, no more vigilantes, no more superheroes in New York City. Um, and is really cracking down on that. Okay. So it's, it's a bit dark rain. Um, it's a bit civil war and in, it's just big enough outside of Daredevil stuff where, you know, all the Marvel characters get to get involved. Um, so, like, it's, you know, that if you're reading X-Men comics, it's not going to overlap that much. But again, there is that Devil's Reign X-Men series. Mostly it connects to the Laraz and Duggan stuff in X-Men because they're writing the big superhero X-Men team in New York City, right? Anything outside of New York City, Krakoa, what do they care? Um, so it, it's been good, I, I would say. But it's not, it, I do like the major twist that is happening in Devil's Reign, I'm pretty into um, and I don't want to say it yet, because I, I really haven't seen, like, maybe this is just my, you know, we all have our, our bubbles, right, in terms of, like, what we see people talking about. Um, I haven't seen anyone talking about Devil's Reign, <laughs> like, anyone at all. Uh, so I don't want to spoil what happened in, like, the second issue, even though it's been a while. Um, but I do like the general twist that has happened there. It's with a character that I really dig. Um, so that's been cool. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I got on that. Oh, yeah, I'm updating the reading order there, so you can find that in Comic Girls as well. A uh, question here from KJ. Do you think we will see more Sinister Secrets? They added a little mystery to the overall mythos that really made me think. Uh, I would be shocked. Shocked, I say, if Karen Gillan didn't add some Sinister Secrets. Um, I, I, first off, I think we need more Sinister Secrets answered than asked. But I would be absolutely shocketh if Karen Gillan did not add some Sinister Secrets to the pie. Um, that would be surprising. You know, that reminds me, I just published the, uh, the Road to Judgment Day reading order is now up in Comic Herald as well. I got all sorts of stuff. Check out that site. It's awesome. Man, what a site. So cool. Um, <laughs> but that, that reminds me because Karen Gillan, his, um, his first run on Uncanny X-Men, or his first story arc, was Everything is Sinister. The first three issues of that, which involves Mr. Sinister, like, taking over a celestial head. Okay, so is it going to directly tie to Judgment Day? Almost certainly not. Um, th that's the Marvel event where the Eternals and X-Men are going to come into conflict. And the Avengers are going to stand in the middle and say, break it up, apparently. Um, but there's there's just enough tangential relationship there where, do I think Uncanny X-Men Everything is Sinister is going to be a major part of Judgment Day? No. Do I think it'd be weird if it isn't even mentioned that Mr. Sinister once hijacked the head of a Celestial? Yes. Yes, I do. So I hope I hope it comes up. Um, all right, let's see if we've got any final questions. I'm going to chug a glass of water. And uh, if we don't have anything here, then we can call it. I'm seeing from AV here, um, comment on Moira's, it was my dream two line when she wants to depower mutants. Yeah, th that was interesting. Uh, so there's a moment where Moira actually has like one page to reflect on her circumstances and the fact that she is now persona non grata in Krakoa and, and seemingly can't, I, you know, I, I questioned this last time, but it was like, 
she can't call Professor X Magneto? Like, what, what happened there? I guess now also she thinks maybe they gave her cancer, so I mean, wouldn't want that to be my first call. Um, but she says, like, about Krakoa, it was my dream too. Which is interesting. Um, certainly she can take credit for the success and the knowledge it took to get Krakoa to that point, right? Like, like even though it feels like, you know, it started with House and Powers, this is a years-long journey for all these characters, and obviously decades-long journey, we're talking publication history. Um, so in that regard, it makes sense. I think what is strange is, you know, the revelation in Inferno number 4 was, okay, what is Moira's big secret plan? And apparently it was to cure mutant kind. Like, the one thing that she felt she hadn't done because she got stopped by Mystique and Destiny back in her third lifeline was she had never developed the cure to actually make it so that mutant kind could, like, not <laughs> be mutant kind and not come into conflict with humanity and machines in the same way. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of next questions that come about there, like, um, okay, but if the machine uprising was going to take over uh, humankind and mutants anyway, and if that's going to be like a war, then how does curing mutant kind help with that situation? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the answer there would be. Um, but, you know, because that's kind of her secret plan, the, the whole, it was my dream too. Well, like, her was her dream a successful thriving Krakoa into the future? Or was it curing mutant kind? Because it seems like it was curing mutant kind. So that felt a little at odds. Um, I, I do agree if that's, if that's what you're getting at by bringing that up. I, I have to say I think I agree. Um, I'm, again, like, this is why I want more of this character is because we need to understand more of the thinking and more of the planning, there has not been enough of it, you know? I definitely want to see more. Um, all right, what else do we got? <clears throat> do you think we'll ever see Cadre K again? All the space stuff, and there's mutant skulls, I think I mean scrolls that Xavier founded. Um, yeah, so Cadre K is a group of uh, scrolls that Professor X led <laughs> for a stretch. I think in the Alan Davis stuff in the 90s. Um, we should see Cadre K. There's enough going on with mutants in space and with everything that's happened with S.W.O.R.D. and with mutant currency, Mysterium, being the prominent currency in the galaxy. Uh, that feels like an Al Ewing pull that can and should and probably will happen. <laughs> so I hope so. That would be pretty fun. Um, Rams are going to smoke the Bengals this Sunday, says Justin. Uh, you know, I've, I've been rooting for the Rams. I was rooting for Rams Chiefs pretty hard. I, I was hit not super personally, because I'm a Bears fan, so I have no stake and no soul anymore. Um, but, but I was definitely rooting for Rams Chiefs in terms of a high-scoring, just fun, flying game. Uh, I like watching the Rams. I'm glad they're in the Super Bowl. Both my kids that can speak prefer the Bengals and the Tiger costumes. Um, and they've picked the Bengals in every game, and they've been right every game so far. Uh, so it, it's obviously going to be the Bengals again. Like, at some point, you just have to recognize, like, oh, obviously, the kids rooting for the Tigers are pulling the strings here. <laughs> They're going to win. Uh, so so I'm here for the Bengals upset. Um, are we to assume that X death so far is during the seven days that Professor X and Magneto are dead? No. No, you are not, because Professor X is in this comic. He is uh, helping Gene transport Wolverine. Um, so no, he's alive. <clears throat> You would think Moira would hide caches of supplies all over the place in case of something like this. Yeah, you would. Uh, that's definitely been one of my biggest knocks on on not only Moira, but Professor Magneto. Is just like, okay, they have all this knowledge. They have nine lifelines of knowledge. And they're all this planning to get to Krakoa. And then once we're there, there's a lot of stuff that just feels like fly by the seat of your pants. Like, you know, no planning. Like, oh, we'll let's see what happens. I like the idea of Moira the Schemer in the Planner a lot more. Also, like, what was she doing in that biome? What was she doing? I don't know. Like, she was reading Destiny's Diaries. That hasn't come up yet. <laughs> what did she get out of that? Anything? Anything? That bothers me, clearly. Um, yes, I need I need a more strategic Moira. I think that would be good. What else do we got? Do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah, throw... Listen... I can't give financial advice, and I will not give gambling advice. But if I did, if I did, the tiger stripes. Okay? Just follow the tiger stripes. That's all I'm saying. All right? Um, I don't know what this question is supposed to be, but something about Hulk Grand Design. Uh, 
I don't think that comic exists. I'm not huge into grand design anymore. You know, I, I liked it conceptually when Ed Pisker was doing X-Men grand design. But then, like, once he got out of the Silver Age and the stuff I hadn't read as thoroughly, and you got into the Claremont run where I had read it, it was kind of it's kind of the thing I was joking about earlier with like YouTube videos where it's like, I don't know, I just read these comics. <laughs> and I have. And that was a better experience. Um, I know that's not the easiest thing for everyone. Um, not everyone can just read hundreds of comics, but also why not? Just do it. <laughs> um, I know it's not that easy. Uh, Hulk Grand Design would not be my first pick, I suppose, for a Grand Design series. I mean, I've seen a lot of... Um, I've seen a lot of push right now for a um, Michael Fife Spider-Man, which would be cool, you know, for the, the writer artist of Copra. Um, that would be a good fit. You know, that would be a good fit. You know, I, I actually I had an interview with Tom Scholey, um when we talked about Fantastic Four Grand Design. And that was great. I really liked Tom Scholey's work. Um, I really liked um, Godland is interesting. Um, his, his biography, Jack Kirby King Comics, is awesome. Like, absolutely essential reading. I did not love Fantastic Four Grand Design that much, though. Um, which makes for an awkward interview <laughs> when you get somebody that you like on, but you're like, mm, this work, I don't know. Um, it was just, it was just too much. Like it's, it's such a better experience to just sit and read what Stan Jack and, and the teams put together, you know, and a Marvel Unlimited on script, a subscription is, you know, the cost of the comic. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty checked out on, on grand design. I think Hulk would actually be a character where that would be somewhat effective because I haven't read, you know, Hulk's not a, oh, read every issue kind of character, right? Like those runs definitely don't get talked about in as um, critically acclaimed and sort of canonical terms. Uh, so a grand design kind of thing would probably actually call attention to some stuff that I had not read before, like a fair amount. Um, so that'd be interesting. But yeah, I mean, depending on who it's, I mean, those projects are all like, because they're doing it in that cartoonist kind of style, you know, with Pisker, Shioli, um, maybe Fife on Spider-Man, like it's all about who's the cartoonist involved and do you like their style, right? And, and are you going to dig it? So I think uh, if it was a cartoonist that I was really into, like if they announced like um, Junie Ba, Black Panther, Grand Design, like, yeah, I'm checking that out. Like, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it, it, FF Grand Design, it did not hit for me. Um, you know, that, it's actually, I don't know, some about Fantastic Four, man. It's like that, like I really like Tom Shealy's work, but that one didn't hit. Um, Fantastic Four Life Story. I love Mark Russell's stuff, um, but that one didn't hit for me either. Like I just kind of, I don't know. I just, it was as much as I like Spider-Man life story. I saw that one and I was like, hmm, I don't know. I'm just not as into it. Something, something tricky, something tricky. Um, Jim Rugg. Okay. So it's just straight up the cartoons kayfabe connection. <laughs> just everyone on that channel is getting to do a grand design. Um, I mean, Jim Rugg that I did buy a, a Kickstarter, of his, um, the, uh, Octobriana, which was this blacklight comic, like amazing looking comic book. Like I love having a physical comic of that. Um, it's so cool. So yeah, I mean, I'll want to check out the Hulk. I'll, I'll see what it looks like, but I don't know. I'm pretty on the fence about grand design stuff going forward. Um, it definitely, yeah. An X-Men life story would be interesting. That's an interesting concept. I'm, I'm definitely, I, well, Hmm. I mean, cause here's the thing is like, kind of that's what Logan is the movie, right? Like Logan, the movie is kind of X-Men life story. Um, maybe done same with old man logan in some ways right i guess those are wolverine life story centric stories um but it, it's not kind of how we think it's going to end <laughs> more often than not i i would rather an x-men life story i could definitely buy into depending on the creative team um but i would rather see just more future timelines explored in the actual krakoan era uh where we are although um whew, now that you say x-men life story that's got the wheels turning that could be cool definitely if you were to pick a nation that hasn't had conflict with krakoa yet which country? Um, hmm. Ha, 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 ha. That's interesting. Who do I want to put at war? <laughs> That's a fun thing to talk about. I mean, Wakanda is the obvious pick, right? But I guess saying they haven't had conflict yet is, is probably wrong because Storm straight up invaded Wakanda during Ten of Swords, right? Um, so that's probably not accurate. Um, I've seen here somebody say, you didn't like Spider-Man Life Story. No, I like Spider-Man Life Story. Spider-Man Life Story is really good. Um, that, that's not what I meant to say, if that's what I said. Uh, yeah, I mean, Wakanda is the only, Wakanda is the only nation that I, I am, I'm not interested really in Krakoa having actual conflict with real nations. 
<laughs> like, that's not especially interesting. I mean, I guess America is the most interesting to me because it's where I live. So, like, that would have some connection. But also because that's where, you know, so many of the superheroes are because that's where the comics come from, right? From New York and, and the Avengers and all that. So, like, if they're going to have odds politically, um, you know, with a superpower... I think America would definitely fit. Obviously, they're already doing it with Russia. Percy's already doing that in X Lives and Wolverine. Um, but yeah, I mean, Wakanda would be the one that's the most fun because it's fictional and because, um, you know, like that's... I'm interested in the distinctions that they're making with Wakanda not accepting their drugs, with them being an isolated power that is somewhat comparable. I think you can have a more of an allegorical conversation that is healthier and, and easier to explore than you can do with some other stuff. Um, all right. Let's see. There was one other thing. Why do you think Professor X hasn't tried to contact Moira? I, it, I find that odd. I do find that odd. Um, I don't know. It's a good question. That, that feels like a story, right? That feels like something that should come up in this event. Because it doesn't totally make sense. It doesn't, it does not totally make sense to me. Um, even if they're on the outs. And even if Professor X knows, okay, everybody knows about the plan, Mystique and Destiny want to kill Mara, we can't bring her back here, you feel like they'd still be having a conversation. Um, they were not so far gone. Unless Mara thinks they gave her cancer, you know, and, and will not speak to them. They were not so far gone relationally. I mean, they had big problems. But, like, that's, like, the only possible ally Mara has at this point. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. I would, I would like to see a conversation between them. Um, do, 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 conflict with, uh, drinking contest with Ireland. We could do that. We could do Wolvie, Storm, Tennis Sword style drinking contest with Ireland. Give Australia some shine. Let's throw them in there as well. Yeah. Like a, a drinking contest of the nations. Just generally sounds fun. <laughs> so I'm here for that. All right, cool. This is good. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, again, uh, my pick is Bengals, uh, X Deaths of Wolverine. I'm giving... Three Wolverine Claws out of uh, 4.2, and uh, New Mutants is rules. New Mutants is good. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining live. I'll be back again next week talking next week's X-Men comics. I haven't even looked at what they are yet. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to do that right after this. Thanks for joining. Uh, like, subscribe, comment on the channel. All that stuff helps me out. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.